each other. I prefer something over something else, you have it differently and hence there is a room for exchange. And then I'm better off as a result of that and you are better off as a result. And by the way, uh, it actually is, gives you a hint that in order to, to be wealthier, to have better life, you don't need to produce anything. I mean production is good as well and it's actually an exchange of a sort as well. But it's enough if we reallocate the existing stuff we already have. So if I sell you my cell phone and you give me money or you exchange the cell phone or I exchange cell phone for something poor, if you have a book, then the same stuff will exist, but we will be better off. Right? So actually society, we can say that society is better off because of the existence of exchange. Nothing new was produced, just different people own different stuff as a result of each change, and that's, that makes them happier. Now, um, I use the typology of interventions from uh, Murray Rothbard. Um, you have in your readings a few chapters from his book, uh, Power and Market, subtitle is Government and the Economy. Uh, and actually, I back home in Prague, I, I used that book as a textbook for the whole course called Economics of State Interventionism. So I did I give you a flavor of the structure. You can elaborate upon and actually go into a lot of details regarding the effects of governmental intervention. Uh, and I'll show you while doing that that it's actually, or what, what, what typically is not presented to students as governmental regulation. In other words, I'll present you that this approach, the Robardian, Misesian approach to the study of governmental interference is actually much broader and much deeper than standard approaches. Uh, last introductory remark, yesterday I presented an issue in which because of governmental activity or central bank activity, people got confused, they misperceived reality, and as a result, they acted differently, which then ended up in a problem, malinvestment, and the boom bust cycle. Uh, today, I will talk about uh, more direct governmental interventions so that the government does not mislead people, the government does not confuse people. Government actively acts to stop people from doing something. Now, we can distinguish three, uh, three possible sorts of, of interventions. The first one we may call autistic, and that means that you have to parties, number one and number two, two people, who are in hegemonic relationship. One, the red one, is the bad guy, is the hegemon, somebody who forces the other one to, do, to act in a way. So this, this guy uses his power to change the behavior of the other guy, number two, uh, in two possible ways. He either makes him do something which he does not want to do, so, or he prohibits him uh, doing something which he would otherwise do. Uh, an example, and there is no exchange involved, there is no transfer of money involved, it's just the use of force of one to change behavior of somebody else who behaves peacefully. An example of this autistic intervention are things uh, like that the state uh, prohibits a citizen from praying to a god of his choice. Uh, for example, because there is only one legal religion in the country and the, the citizen does not like the, the God approved by the government and like somebody else. 
right? So that, that would be an example of it. No exchange, just this guy wants to do something home without you know, being disturbed, and the hegemon says, no way, you can't do it. Um, or actually, it could be that um, somebody wants to not necessarily pray to a god, but wants to spread certain ideology, and doesn't matter which one it is, uh, and the, the state says, this is against my will. You can't uh, you know, explain to students logical free market economics. That's against the law. I will not allow you to do it. Right. Or, uh, you know, it could be more uh, sensitive issue, like you have some uh, you know, Nazis uh, that want to meet in the pub and sing some songs where they claim that you know, white people are better than black people or you know, whatever, but you know, they don't kill anybody, they just sing stupid songs. Uh, and number one says, no way, you can't do it. Same, same stuff, same type of intervention. Government uses his force, its force to change behavior of a group of people. <coughs> number one, I'm mean, sorry, number two is something which is called binary interventions. We once again have two, two people as before, number one, hegemon, number two is the one who is um, the target of his force, of his power. In this sense, the hegemon forces somebody to give hegemon back something, a gift. So a sort of forced gift. Um, now, what would be examples of this kind of activity? Well, the most obvious one is taxation. Right. Unvoluntary transfer of resources from your pocket to somebody else's pocket. <coughs> so taxation of whatever kind is an example of binary interventions. Uh, and you know that when the last century started, the overall redistribution was typically on average in single digits. So few percentage percentages from the GDP or national income got redistributed. Whereas when the century ended, the redistribution was somewhere close and sometimes even more than 50% of what people made. Uh, so more than half of what you made had to be sent to somebody and then bureaucrats decided what to buy with the money. So uh, 20th century is normally the century of inflation, which we talked about yesterday, but also the century of huge growth of the state, huge growth of state budgets and redistribution. And by the way, a century of the most horrible wars, and there are links. I mean, that's not a coincidence, because you may very nicely claim that the redistribution, the role of the state, the inflation, the growth of the role of the state, the inflation, has something to do with more wars being waged. <clears throat> but we don't have time for that. Another example of this kind of intervention is, uh, uh, for example, that you are uh, forced some countries uh, to uh, go and serve obligatory <coughs> military service. So conscription or draft is another example. There, you do not pay with money but you have to spend your time uh, working for the government. So you, you pay in time or services you provide. So draft or military service is a very nice topic for economists to show how wasteful it is. Uh, another, that uh, it is another sort of uh, intervention, or binary intervention. Or statistical office uh, sends you um, if you own a firm, uh, a form, and says, 
could you please fill it? Uh, how many all these details about your your business? How many computers you have? How many employers you have? How many who knows what you have? Uh, and actually, they don't say, please, could you do it? They say, do it. If not, there is a law which says <coughs> it is your obligation to spend time or waste time on filling it in. Uh, if you don't respond within 15 days, we will actually sue you. Right? So obligatory reporting is another sort of governmental intervention of this kind. You have to do something else which you would otherwise do for the state, uh, use your time for somebody else. Um, and we could come up with a few more examples. So, third one, triangular. So, the three people now still have the hegemon. Number one, and now we have a pair of other people, two and three, they are about to engage in an exchange because they find that beneficial, as we explained a while ago. And now the, the hegemon says, no way, you can't do it unless something happens. So we have now three people, two are subject to the power of the hegemon, and uh, he might say, um, you cannot exchange, or you can exchange only if the price for what you exchange satisfies me as a hegemon. That means it's higher than something or lower than something. Here we have so-called price controls, and the most obvious and you know, classical textbook examples is rent control. And the state says, if you want to rent an apartment, you number two to you number three, you have to do it for less than what the law says. This is rent control. Or uh, minimum wages, where the, uh, the state says, if you want to employ the guy, you have to pay him more than what the legal minimum is. So minimum, maximum prices are example of triangular interventions, and I'm sure I do not need to, to talk more about it because this is what everybody knows. It's elementary economics. Uh, um, shortages created in case of rent control and maximum prices and surpluses such as surplus of labor, that is unemployment created by uh, minimum wages or minimum prices uh, in general. And the second one is uh, what can be called product control. Product control. And that means that the state would say to these two people, all right, you can exchange the thing, but not under the terms you find beneficial, but under my terms, such as uh, the exchange is possible only if number two, who is a taxi driver, for example, is licensed by the government, perhaps city government, depends. So licenses will be one example of product control. So governmental regulations somehow uh, affecting the, the market. Or, uh, if you know, number two is a uh, patient and number three is a doctor, uh, and they, they see that they can help each other out, uh, the government might come and say, okay, but you doctor, you actually must be a doctor uh, like who we consider to be a doctor. So you have to be a member of professional organization of doctors. Otherwise, you can't treat people. Otherwise, if you do that, you know, we'll stop the exchange and we'll put you to jail because you will be an unofficial doctor and in this position you cannot treat people. Or, um, 
one is you know, number one is here, number two is here, and uh, what they see that there is a possible benefit from engaging in an exchange, and suddenly they are almost about to exchange states. And suddenly uh, they discover that actually there is a border between them, and then uh, there is a state official sitting here saying, all right, if you want to exchange, you have to first pay me some money. That is called tariffs. So international regulation of international trade, tariffs, another kind of governmental intervention of this sort. Or I want to employ you in my factory. Uh, I, you know, I open up a new outlet. I look for good workers, uh, efficient employees. I discovered that actually you are the one whom I would like to employ. And suddenly the state says, oh, but you are here, uh, you know, the factory is in Prague and this guy is from Ukraine. And you cannot employ a guy from Ukraine even if he is good, because first you have to employ Czech people. Uh, because the law says so. So uh, actually, the, so that's called immigration control or protection of local labor markets. And what actually the government is doing in this situation is that they, you know, you as an employer, you typically tend to be what economists call color blind. You don't care about colors of your employees. You don't care about their uh, religion or you know, whatever, what you care about is how uh, productive they are, how much they can contribute to the production of products which you sell. So, you know, that's what matters, uh, efficient production for it, productivity. Whereas now the state says, forget about productivity, what matters is color of your passport. Or that means more like, you know, you have to see uh, people or judge people according to something else than what is actually uh, important for production. So government actually is kind of forcing you to behave in a discriminatory way. You, you would normally never do it because you, know, you, 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 you are attempting to make money. But because of this regulation, you can't do it. Or uh, imagine uh, you want to open a bar here in downtown Vilnius. And uh, for some reason, could be good or bad reason, but you know, we are not here to discuss the merit of it. Just it's your choice. Uh, you are an owner of the place, so extension of property me is or means that you decide under what terms you know, people are uh, allowed to use what, what is yours. So you open a bar and you, for example, say, uh, it is a bar for uh, everybody except Russians. Could be a good reason for it, I don't know. But in any case, you can't do it because though you might have willing clients to go to your bar, you will make money by sending, selling them products. The state says, that's against the law. We have something here called anti-discrimination legislation. And this, is, this cannot be done. So use this, he, his hegemonic power to force you uh, to, to behave in a way which you would not want to behave. And you know, this is it was just one example. It could be that uh, you want to have a bar for smokers only. Um, you can you can have it. You might want to have something for you know, whatever group you, you might want to host in your place. Uh, simply you cannot do it and hence anti discrimination legislation, though it sounds good, is actually you know, governmental interference of this sort in triangular intervention. I'll be happy to elaborate on it later on if you are interested. Or, once again, a bar example. You want to open a bar, uh, and once again, as an owner, you should have the right to 
set the conditions of entry. Uh, and for, once again, for whatever reason, you decide that you are not willing to accept local currency, it does, uh, and that simply euros are good enough to be accepted only. You might not like the governor of, of the central bank, or and I know you have you know, currency war, so it's something uh, slightly different. But in any case, you know, it sounds like a peaceful decision. I'm an owner, and I just ask people to pay me in something which is not local paper currency. Well, you cannot do it in most countries, because there is something called uh, legal tender laws. You are obliged to use local currency in all, or not use, but to, to accept local currency in your facilities inside national territory. So legal tender laws will be another example of triangular intervention. Or uh, you have a forest, own a forest, and uh, you might decide at one point that you don't want to have it anymore, that you want to sell the, the trees to a uh, furniture factory. Right? Sounds like a good deal. Furniture factory is happy about the, the, the wood. You are happy about the, the deal as well. So both parties expect the benefit. Then the hegemon shows up and says, oh, forget about it. You can't actually do it because we have laws, generally called conservation laws, uh, in which state tells you that actually you have to keep some of natural resources to be available for future generations. So it's not more, uh, it's not in your power to sell what you believe was yours. There are plans how you have to handle forests that you can cut down some trees, but not all, and it's all heavily regulated. Uh, very nice topic. We might get back to it today in the afternoon while uh, when talking about uh, externalities and environment and these things. But for our purposes, that's another kind of triangular intervention product control. Uh, a few more examples. Uh, imagine you are. Uh, you own a house and have a, a fence, and um, in your little village, you want to have a very special um, post box where you get your newspapers every morning, too. Uh, and you happen to have old uh, helmet for American football and you just attach the helmet to the fence and have and hence have the, the fancier post box in your in your little towel. And you know it looks like so what? Why why is why why do we mention it? Well the thing is that you have set of laws that actually prohibit you from using your property in some way such as this one because and this is a real example a helmet attached to a fence to be used as a post box is actually, or mailbox, is actually a patented uh, thing. So, in order to do it, you would need to pay royalties to some you know, crazy inventor of this, uh, of this thing. Otherwise, you break the law. So, <coughs> patent laws are another example of triangular intervention, and it's a fascinating field uh, where you have uh, economic, legal, historical, political aspects. Uh, and today it's taken as if you know, there is nothing to discuss. You have these patents or intellectual property in general, including copyrights. And it's just given and it has to be followed. And if not, police is caught. Well, it's actually not that easy. Um, F.A. Hayek, whom we talked about yesterday and in his they mentioned his uh, monetary uh, theories. He has a very nice quote in, in his book, Fable Conceit, where he says, it is very suspicious that the same people who are the strongest opponents of the concept of property, 
Popper was explaining a few days ago, the essence of it, Hayek says, the same people are the strongest advocate of something which is a kind of modern form of property called intellectual property, that is patent and copyright. Hence, to put bluntly, all those socialists who say, you know, property is not important, uh, you know, for the benefit of society, sometimes you need to nationalize and all that property boundaries has to be manipulated in order to achieve you know, whatever they pick. The same people who don't understand how and why property is important, they actually say patents and copyrights are the most important thing. And Hayek says, that's strange. How come that? You know, there is something wrong here. And it's a hint that uh, actually um, the so-called intellectual property is a completely different thing. It's different from standard property. And you have actually a very nice argument. You can present a very nice argument against the very existence of patents and copyrights. If you want, if you like, I can get back to it. Nice talk. Uh, and I guess that might, that that's enough. We can go on and on and on. In any case, what we what we have done here is that we see that uh, there are all sorts of governmental interventions to functioning of the free market. And it should be clear for those who understand why market is important. Uh, I explained yesterday that, using Misesian uh, analogy, that we see a complex reality through through prices, so the prices generated uh, by the market are our eyes and our ears, uh, because otherwise we are not able to understand what's going on around, so we use that to allocate resources, we use prices, uh, and as, as Hayek always emphasized, uh, you can nicely allocate, you, you can have direct knowledge in small communities, your family, regarding the preferences on the one hand and available resources on the other hand. So for example, you can, you can buy a good present to your parent for Christmas because you know what they like, you know how much money you have, what, you know, so how much you can spend, what's available, for what purpose. You can do that, but you cannot do it for something bigger than a family or perhaps a small village. Today, when you produce t-shirts in China, you have no idea who will buy it. You have no idea how the t-shirt gets produced, where the, the material for it, where does it come from. And hence, you just use prices of inputs and outputs to adjust production to be the most efficient one. Right? So and once we understand that, we also, uh, have to understand that uh, whenever government says, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you have, you know, your number one option was this, but that's out of question, you have to behave in a different way. That through these regulations, prices are affected, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. <coughs> and hence, you, you perceive reality wrongly. And hence, there is more waste in the economy. And hence, the economy, now speaking of global economy, gets poorer. Because not the uh, most urgent needs are satisfied, because state prohibits them. Also, uh, and hence, all these regulations should be seen as problems for the market. And now you can see that you very nicely can build the whole course about it and go step by step through all these regulations and see what exactly the consequences are. Uh, also, I shall mention here that um, for all those, um, or most of those activities, you have private alternatives, uh, so to speak. Um, so, number one, the hegemon is not necessarily the state. We, we use it that way here because uh, with the size of today's state, it's the most typical uh, representant of this hegemon. But, uh, you know, let's go through it and, and 
uh, talk about the private alternatives. Uh, you know, here I said autistic intervention, somebody prohibits you from you know, doing something, uh, praying to a god or believing in an in a ideology or something. It can nicely, very nicely be you know, a private person who says, well, if you will believe in God number two and not God number one, I'll kill you. Right? That causes the information as well. So it can happen, it happens from time to time, but state does it more in a more systematic way because it has legislation available. By their intervention, a highwayman stops you and says, give me your money, otherwise I'll shoot you. Right? What is it? Well, that's binary intervention. It's, it's not in principle different from the uh, you know, taxing authority <coughs> who says, you pay your taxes, otherwise you'll, you'll be put to jail, and if you try to escape, we'll shoot you. Right? That's the same thing. So, and yes, one, one is legal and one is illegal. No doubt about it. But what we are interested here about is economic consequences of this kind of activity, and we do not really care whether it's legal or illegal as economists. That's a, you know, for lawyers to, to, to explain the subtleries of those two situations. Economists just explain, okay, if this happens, that will be the consequences. And, and here, uh, well, it could be the same thing. Uh, uh, you know, so, somebody like uh, when we have tariffs or well, normally tariff. You know, that can be performed by single individual as well, somebody who extorts uh, money from um, you know, traders. That can very well happen, and it sometimes happens. But once again, it's done systematically by thousands and millions of people uh, under the umbrella of the state. That's why we talk about the state here. Um, Now, let me take this one example, uh, because I mentioned before prohibitions. Uh, and, or, right before I do that, uh, it should be, we should now see a general pattern of who gains, who benefits, and who loses here. Uh, in all those situations, Number one, the hegemon gains, because otherwise he would not do that. Uh, he may gain in what economists call psychic uh, income, so you know, satisfaction which is not connected to money, just you know, he has power over you that makes him happy. Uh, so in all cases, actually, psychic income can place or play a role, sorry. Uh, here, when there is no transfer of resources, that's the only gain he can get. Uh, number two, loses, he cannot behave the way as he wanted, or here, he had to provide the gift, so he loses. And number one, in binary intervention setting, gets some monetary gains as well. Taxes flow into somebody's pocket. So number one gains, number two loses. Here with triangular interventions, it's more uh, complicated uh, because we are not sure what happens to those two. We know for sure that at least one of the two, either number two or number three, he loses. Uh, but it can very well be the case that number two gains Imagine, uh, we, we, we mentioned price control, rent control. So if the state says, you owner of a house, you cannot rent apartments for more than something, then you know, the uh, people who rented apartments and now because of the state power pay less as rent, they are happy. Uh, so it could be that one loses the owner of the house, one gains the one who rented it out. Uh, However, very typically, the gain for the one is only very, or not necessarily very, but it's short term. In long term, that guy loses as well. 
in case of rent control, you all, you all should know that uh, there is no uh, more efficient way how to destroy cities than either war or rent control. That means that if you have rent control for sufficiently long period, homes start to deteriorate. And hence, yes, the guy pays lower rent for some time, but over time, he can't live in the house because uh, the uh, you know, heating is leaking and it's not uh, you know, the old quality living as before, but there is deterioration. And you know, in, in uh, America, we had these uh, places like, like Harlem or Bronx, like places where rent control completely destroyed those parts of towns. So uh, could be short-term benefit for some, but often they both lose in the long, time, long term. Now, um, when you open a textbook in economics, very often you have a section with regulations. Uh, and economists are eager to explain that some regulations are really harmful, <coughs> such as uh, price control, that's very often, you know, chapter number one, rent control, minimum wages, that's discussed very typically. So all economists typically talk about. When you take product control, uh, some parts of it are discussed, such as licenses. Licenses are very often discussed. Uh, could be... Uh, then it depends on the textbook, some more uh, regulation discussed as well. But um, often, um, something which we describe as interventions here is not perceived as intervention, such as, and the one actually I didn't mention, you, I mentioned antitrust legislation, anti-discrimination legislation, but antitrust legislation can be another example. You want to merge with a partner, so two friends want to merge, and the hegemon says, no way, you cannot merge. You cannot have bigger firm because that will be uh, you know, against our antitrust policy. Um, or you know, Microsoft wants to, to actually distribute for free Explorer and the government says, you can't do it because it's anti-competitive behavior. And you have a, a talk by Remigius on it, so I, I don't need to go into it. Uh, but I need to illustrate on this point that, that many economists believe that, for example, anti-trust uh, legislation is a kind of necessary precondition for functioning of the market. There are some schools that made that high point of their uh, research agenda, such as the German uh, Ordo Liberal School, the Freiburg School, uh, people like Walter Eucken, uh, and uh, in practical uh, politics, uh, Ludwig Erhard, who is also author of the German post-World War economic miracle. These people say, if you leave free market uh, without some control mechanism, such as without antitrust legislation, it will deteriorate. And hence, whereas people like Mises and Rothbard and Hayek, Hoppe and others will say antitrust legislation is a violation of property right principle, it's, uh, it's you know, plain regulation, it should, be, should not be there, and they explain why, and Remigius will explain that to you. Uh, some say, no, you have to have it because it's only once you have it, then you can have a market. Um, or, so there are, there are plenty of those, and, and perhaps anti-trust, legi anti-discriminatory legislation will be also one. And some people believe it's a precondition for the market. It's not a place where you can have market. Whereas, you know, people from the Austrian tradition would claim, no, that, that's, 
once you accept the property right principle and then voluntary exchange, you can't justify regulations of this sort, such as antitrust or anti-discrimination legislation. It's then a plain regulation, plain paternalism, uh, and it has very bad consequences. Or, when speaking of taxation, uh, a lot of economists speak in uh, textbooks about how bad progressive taxation is. Right? They would say, you know, it discourages savings and who knows what. And hence, uh, actually, the situation with the flat tax revolution, so called in, in Europe, that it was Central Europe when. These arguments somehow materialized in real uh, politics. And uh, though the flat tax is progressive as well, but uh, at least you know, that's a sort of direction from more progressive to less progressive taxation. Um, and all that sounds as if uh, proportional, from progressive to proportional, proportional does not have these problems as if the only problem was progressive taxation and nothing else. Uh, so if you eliminate progression, you solve the problem. Then you don't have, uh, many claim, the you know, distortionary effect to market price structure, and hence you don't have waste. But it should be very clear that it simply does not matter in which way you uh, raise taxes. Uh, whenever you do it, it has effects. And you should be aware, as somebody who studies economic uh, reality or economic economics as a science, that you should be aware of these effects and that these are for sure binary interventions. So, and you know, autistic interventions are not often discussed, uh, perhaps never discussed, because you don't have exchange here. Uh, real kind of each and no money flow, so this is not considered at all. Um, but it should, I believe, this is partly considered progression often, but not proportional taxes in, from this category. Some are and some not. I just want you to remember that whenever you find a hegemonic relation, somebody forces somebody else to behave differently. It affects his behavior and it distorts market and prices and it has consequences. Um, now, I want to have a case study uh, which I announced describing a phenomenon of prohibition which belongs to the product control, but sometimes it has certain elements of the price uh, regulation as well. Uh, the thing is that in some instances the state says, oh, you want to exchange this product? No way. Under no conditions you can have it. Uh, that's called prohibition. And I want to use this uh, the sensitive issue of body parts uh, to just show you that you can apply economics even to these things. And actually, there is a nice book, uh, you can Google it, it's online, called Prohibitions, published by the oldest European think tank called Institute of Economic Affairs, so Google Prohibitions, IEA. Uh, and you get a nice book, 150 pages, uh, 10 or 10 plus chapters, so few pages per chapter, uh, describing all kind of prohibitions from uh, uh, what comes first to our mind is alcohol prohibition, uh, gambling, prostitution, uh, then body parts, you know, boxing, advertising, all kind of things. And it's a very nice collection of sort of simple economics applied to you know, problems that 
governments often create, and then we suffer consequences. Now, uh, let's start with this case study. Uh, you may know that when you say in front of some people that um, you know, there should be uh, or that there is economic problem with, with body parts such as kidneys, some people say, how, how do you mean it? How can you say market in something so uneconomic as a kidney? It's not nice because the you know, human body is not a commodity. It's, you, know, you, should not, you should not talk about it. Well, perhaps uh, you might find it difficult to talk about it. However, um, you know, see or, or realize this. Uh, there are many people who suffer from kidney from kidney problems, and hence these people are get sick, and many of them die because of that. And the reason is that some people can get treated, some people can get kidney transplants, but not all. So what you have here is actually a shortage of something which can save people's lives. And whenever you hear shortage, you should be aware that this is economic problem, though it's not perceived in that way uh, often. Now, let me draw supply demand and show you something. Quantity, price, and standard supply demand and just have it in this way so that it intersects the horizontal axis. Supply demand. Um, now, There is no sin to say now that this supply and demand can actually be supply of kidneys and demand for kidneys. There is no doubt that if price of kidney would go up, there will be more kidneys available on the market. Imagine if somebody would, would tell you, for $2 million, I'm willing to buy a kidney for you. Would you consider that? Some people now, but some people yes. It depends on, 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 on the price and on your opportunities available to, to earn income. Definitely, to some people, the more you pay, the more they are willing to, to respond. Or, uh, you know, it not, it's not necessarily the way that it's your <coughs> kidney from like, you as a living person. It could be, all right, will you be able to donate a kidney once you die, rather not to donate a kidney once you die? Two situations, if you get nothing for it, or if you get $1 million for it. Because then many people will say, OK, that, that's nice. I, I, as a, you know, Grandma, I can donate, I can actually save somebody's life by donating a kidney when I die. And at the same time, I can give some money to my you know, grandkids to buy a good education. So there is no doubt that there is the financial incentive uh, will increase the number of supply, quantity supply of, of things like kidneys. I mean, we should talk about the motivation of people because if there would be such an opportunity to earn so many, so a lot of money, then I think that people would organize to uh, capture people and to well, take well, their. Well, don't worry, we'll get back to it. Yeah. Now, the, you know, we have to go slow. Now, just our problem is is supply upward sloping? And the answer is yes. We don't know how much. And this is not, you know, empirical observation. It just depiction of an idea that with more money which you can get for something, you are willing to provide more of it. 
even if it's a kick. What about demand? Is downward sloping? Once again, yeah. Uh, if kidneys will be for free, more people would, would want to have them. Even if they had smaller problems with their kidneys, if it didn't cost anything, you know, you, you want to fix your body, right? If it doesn't cost much. If it costs a lot, well, then less people will do it. So the, the supply and demand will look like this. Now, the point is that what governments do today is that they say um, that you, if you like, you can donate kidneys under certain conditions, such as if it's not within your family, it has to be unanimous. I don't know, sorry, uh, uh, let's say, uh, anonymous is what I want to say, so that the donor does not know the one who got it. But the condition is that it has to be done for free. So actually, today's system of um, getting and giving kidneys is a system of price regulation where the price is zero. Everything above that is illegal. So it's it's price ceiling, uh, maximum price regulation. So same, same thing as uh, rent control, right? For rent control, we would have, you know, if this is supply for apartment and demand for apartments, government says everything here uh, above is illegal, and the economy then say, all right, demand, quantity demanded is here, what the supply is here, so this thing is a shortage of apartment. This is standard economics. Uh, here, the claim is that this is actually the kidney market is the same thing, just the price ceiling is put to zero. Now, if this is the shortage here, we see one to the demand it, one to the supply here much bigger shortage. And you know, now compare it to apartments. When you there is a shortage of apartment apartments, what what do you do? Uh, well you typically stay longer with your parents or you stay in small apartment because bigger are not available or something of that kind. So it's it troubles you but you can pretty much always live with it somehow. The shortage in the apartment market is not life-threatening uh, situation. Whereas shortage here is life-threatening <coughs> situation. Uh, you know, I have once again data for America because they do studies on it. You know, it would be nice if you write your master's thesis, for example, on it with local data. In America, this difference quantity the supply want to demand it is 70,000 people. So there's a waiting list, 70,000 people wait. At pretty much you know, each moment, sometimes it goes a little up, sometimes a little down, but this is the scope of the issue. 70,000 people waiting, waiting, and waiting. Often they cannot wait that long because they have you know, real problems. Their kidneys are failing. What it means is that many of them die in this waiting line. How many, how many it is? Well, we have figures for it. It is something like 25 people per day. So 25 people die every day because of the existence of shortage in the kidney. And now you see how, how important is economic. You might have whichever moral theory you might want, such as, you know, the God tells me it's against his wish to, to trade kidneys. Uh, you may have it. But eco and economics cannot say much about it, about your you know, religious beliefs or moral philosophical uh, approaches. But it can tell you, all right, if you have it, 
please realize that uh, as a consequence of your uh, belief, this is happening. Cost of it, among other things, is 25 dead people dead. Uh, I, don't worry, I'll get to problems, I, I know you can respond to it. Just now, my point was to show you how, in what sense economics is important in this respect. Uh, shortage of kidneys is in principle not different from shortage in apartments. Uh, you should be aware of the figures of the consequences of their regulation. Uh, now, you might want to know what, what this is, market clearing price for kidneys. Once again, economists wrote studies and you know, it's, a, it's not that obscure topic as it might seem. Very famous people devoted time and energy to write studies on it, both lawyers, uh, economists, philosophers. Uh, economists try to calculate this, so under what price there will not be people dying uh, while waiting in the line. And this, this is something like um, you know, $3,000 per kidney, which, uh, which is not, and sometimes even less, which is not that much, right? A car is much costlier. So it's not that we are talking about millions and millions of, of uh, dollars or you know, multiple annual incomes. We are talking about you know, nice sofa, old car, something you know, with this uh, uh, with this wrench. Now, what can you say now uh, when I present you economic case for dear, for saving people here uh, for the regulation the market which is called the under prohibition. What your objections might be. We heard one, what people will do is they, they would, once it's legal to sell kidneys, they would just form gangs and they would attack people, take their kidneys against their will and sell it, right? which will be horrible. right? That's very nice. Uh, uh, you consider crime. Uh, well, let me answer it right now. Uh, perhaps uh, you do not know much about kidneys, uh, but you definitely know a lot about other prohibitions, uh, such as alcohol prohibition. You know, in textbook, you typically have American prohibition from in 1920s and 1930s, you might have better experience with Soviet prohibition here. I don't have no data on that, and I don't, uh, I have not uh, studied that much. But um, I'm sure you, uh, you have some uh, ideas about what consequences of the American prohibition was. Uh, what, what, what is left, what, you know, when you today say, Prohibition in America, late 1920s, and or the whole of 1920s and early 1930s. What's your first uh, you know, picture you you see? And I guess the first picture typically is what you what you what movies you know from that period. And a typical hero from movies from that time is Al Capone. Uh, Chicago and you know these gangs shooting and all that. And this is exactly it. Uh, crime typically accompanies prohibition. Crime goes up when you have prohibition, not the other way around. Prohibition when it ended, crime went dramatically down, which has a, a clear, you know, uh, economic explanation. Um, you know, how do you typically solve problems when things are legal? You know, you are cheated by your partner, business partner. What do you do? 
Well, you, you, you first try to tell him, hey, don't, don't do it. You see, we have a contract. Please stick to the, to the terms. If he doesn't do it, well, then you sue him. You call police, we have judges, we have courts. So a civilized method of solving issues, right? You don't go and shoot him right on the spot. That, but under normal circumstances. But you very often do it when it's illegal market. But when, because when you have illegal or black markets, you cannot use police because you'll be the first one arrested. You cannot use courts because what you do is illegal. So you have to solve your issues using alternative methods. And hence, the emergence of mafias and all these kind of things. Right? So crime emerges from this because of this reason, during prohibition. Another reason is, uh, imagine uh, you get your kidney legally, and something gets wrong. Well, once again, what you do, you go back to the, to the doctor and say, hey, please uh, see, something got wrong, could you double check whether it's fine, could you fix it? And the doctor says, sure, because I'm trying to build my reputation so that I get more patients. And I'm a good doctor after all. Well, so he treats you nicely. How does he treat you when he did that illegal? When you knock at his door and say, hey, doctor, you, you just transplanted a kidney into my body a week ago and something got wrong. What's his response? I don't, I don't know you. Who are you? Uh, if you show up once again, I, I, I'll take care of it so that you never show again. The reason is that, when I, that what makes our modern society safe and uh, our life uh, safe and quality is that we have all these services that goes with the products, information, and then assurances, warranties, and all that. If something gets wrong, your firm say, all right, you know, we'll replace it, we'll fix it, don't worry. You know, we are a good company. These things cannot and do not work to that extent when you have black market, because it's all illegal. It has to be small, it has to be sort of flexible, it has to be invisible for police. So people behave completely differently uh, because the, the black market situation changes incentives. If the doctor, you know, if the guy who you operated upon, who got the kidney in the black market, if he went somewhere and said, you see the doctor, he, he just didn't do it properly, police would arrest the doctor for 20 years because it's a huge crime to illegally transplant people. So this kind of Violent behavior is typical for prohibition. Uh, third aspect <coughs> Imagine the following situation. You walk here in Vilnius downtown at night, and situation one is that you, uh, you know, are not dressed up well, you, you don't have anything valuable on you, uh, you just walk there, you go home from the pub. Second situation B, you have, uh, you look like a wealthy man, you have, or woman, you have, you know, golden earrings, you have diamonds all, all over the place, um, and you walk at night going from the pub. Under which situation? you are more likely to get assaulted or attacked by someone. And an obvious answer is, well, when there is something real valuable to steal from. Right. So uh, crime can be explained in economic way as well. <laughs> there is the whole branch of economics called economics of crime. And you know it's intuitively clear that, that simply uh, thieves or robbers are economically motivated. They can be crazy as well, right? But there are there is a huge part of crime which has economic explanation. Uh, so higher value, so higher benefit attracts crime. Now 
under what situation, black market or legal market, do you have higher rewards? Uh, and the answer is once again clear. Uh, the typical feature of black market is that the prices are higher. There is a limited, there is limited supply of a good under prohibition, and it's more costly to buy. Hence, you are very likely, or not very likely, but you are more likely to be deprived of your kidney today because your kidney has higher value today because there is less supply of kidneys than under legal market conditions because then kidneys will be more plentiful and hence less scarce and hence cheaper. Right. So if you fear crime, you fear, and you, you like your kidneys, you don't want to be deprived of your kidney, you should be afraid today rather than uh, during time of legal market in things like kidneys. Right. So uh, you know, the realistic approach to situations such as kidney prohibition is exactly you know, what is needed. It's not that you compare some kind of ideal, unrealistic situation that nobody assaults you, there is you know, no crime, and there is everybody happy to you know, what, what, what you know, it is. You have to compare those two situations together. So how is situation when there is prohibition, shortage, higher crime, and many other things? or situ with the situation of legal market uh, where you, know, you can compare those two and see in which you have more of what and why. And this is, this is very crucial. You have a question. Yes, I think that there is one more problem. Yeah. Kidney. 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 there is plenty of risk in life. Um, some people argue that well, it's kind of unjust because those who would be willing to, to risk are, are those who are typically poor. I mean, Bill Gates would not donate his kidney. I mean, would be crazy to do that, right? So many people will do it, uh, or some people will do it, uh, because they are not that well off. Yes, that, that's very true, but it's it's the case in many other occupations. Imagine you have, um, say, an army, a professional army, soldiers who are sent to fight in Afghanistan. Who, who, is, who will be willing to, to sign up for, for such a job? Right? Will Bill Gates do it? Or you know, whoever who is wealthy? No, typically people who are poorer and hence need, more, need money and hence are willing to risk, they will do it. Firefighters, policemen, it'll be the same thing. So there is plenty of activities associated with risk. This is not unique. But you notice that identify people, because at the moment you identify how people rise every day. Yeah. So I think that it can be even more people die every day. No, only if they underestimate the risk. Which is true every it's true everywhere. If and again, so we need more regulation. No, you you might to you might say the there is another problem existing in the world separate from prohibition, and that is that people underestimate risk. And you might claim governments have to interfere here. For example, people do not know or do not appreciate enough that they will get old, and hence they do not have enough savings for their pensions and hence government has to nationalize pension industry. Many people claim that. Or uh, you know, 
people simply risk unnecessarily and there is a role for government to play. It's a valid question, should be analyzed, I'm all in favor of it. How do you fix this possible problem, if it is a problem? But it's not connected to this only, it's just a different issue, risk perception. Uh, or, you know, with smoking, how, how do governments solve problems with smoking and mis they, what they believe is misperception, which I don't believe is misperception. Everybody knows it's, it's not particularly healthy to smoke, but the government believes people just smoke because they believe it's healthy. So what they do, well, they, they put the warning on every cigarette pack. So it might be, you know, uh, you might have policies. If you are afraid of this, well, don't do prohibition just inform people before they, they donate. Make sure they understand what's going on. But uh, the point is still, uh, you have the economic issue here, you have people dying, and you have somehow to increase number of donated kidneys. Monetary incentives is a typical way how it solves in all other markets. Um, Imagine, you know, some people would claim that it's so substantial, uh, so uh, important for life, so substantial, uh, you know, good that markets do not belong here. Um, well, you know, let me use the analogy here, and if, oh, put it this way, it doesn't belong here because the price which clears the market is, is you know, positive. So high, and hence uh, some people will not have money to buy it. Hence, we have to keep the price at zero, and it's it will solve. Well, there are many important uh, commodities in the world without which you cannot live. Food, for example. Um, imagine food market will be organized this way, such as the government would say. Because poor people would not be able to afford food, we, we have prohibition of selling it for a positive price. We will rely on people's willingness to donate charity. People are, after all, nice creatures. They must, and we will have a you know, educational program to motivate people to work more and, and donate more. Well, if you did that, uh, Again, you have supplied quantity, demanded quantity. This uh, shortage will not be you know, 70,000 people who have a problem. It will be 5 billion people who have a problem because there will be a shortage of food. Yes, uh, both rich and poor will have to wait in this line, and both rich and poor would then die, not 25 per day, but many more per day. You know, humanity will be ended within a few weeks, perhaps, when this policy was enforced. Um, now, how do we solve the problem of shortage of food? Well, we have market for food, we have prices, we have competition. Uh, prices are, through competition, pushed down as much as it goes. Quality due to competition goes as up as it's possible. And we have some market clearing uh, price and quantity supplied and demanded so that there is not uh, shortage of food in our countries. Um, now, yes, some people do not have enough money to buy it. That, that's true. So how do we solve it? Well, then we address the problem of poverty. Uh, some people would claim it is a role for government to give them vouchers to buy food. Well, uh, we should analyze consequences of that. Some people would say, you know, charity for those few unhappy can be easily provided by markets. Very nice topic to, to analyze. But, but we understand that we have to have markets so that there is enough in the best possible quality and for the lowest possible price. Uh, so the majority of people get satisfied. And then those few blind people who exist, you know, let's think about how to help them. It's a valid issue. But it will be disaster and stupid to nationalize the whole market to just say, 
you know, everything must be distributed for free. Charity is the way how to provide food because it would be a disaster. Yes, some people will still do that, uh, but the shortage would be enormous. There's a nice saying that, yes, there is love in the world, but there is not enough love in the world to feed five or six billion people. You need something more than love. That is economic system, market system, that induces people to stop watching TV and go and bake bread in the morning. Uh, and hence, quantity of supply in your system. It's not different for, for other things. And yes, kidneys are sensitive. But my point today, and I have to finish, and uh, so I, I, I have a question too, I know. Uh, you know, there are issues that has to be analyzed comparatively using economic insights, such as crime, such as what happens to poor, uh, what happens to quality. These are all relevant questions. And you have to see, all right, how it looks in this situation when the market is legal, how it looks in a situation when the market is black. And then, see, okay, and now I know this will be more problem here, this will be less problem here. All that has something to do with economic coordination, entrepreneurship, uh, operation of the market, and indeed, it has very much to do with the concept of property, so the sort of legal or more or political philosophy part of it. You know, even without economic analysis, if you just, if you are a political philosopher and you understand the concept of property, you just may smash the whole argument of prohibition by arguing, all right, it's my kidney, my property, the extension of my property is that I, I'm, I, it's my right to sell it to whoever I want if you know, I'm willing to do it. And that's the end of the score. So you have you know, different approaches. Economic is more like see how it works in different scenarios. What is more problem here? What is more problem there? And then the property-based approaches. Well, you know, if property exists, my right to do to sell my kidneys and nobody has a right to prohibit me, prohibit me from doing that. I have one amendment regarding selling of your body parts. The kidneys is not thinkable for us, but if they imagine uh, blood, not long ago we were selling blood for money and that was not a problem at all. And the kidneys, you, cannot, you can donate for free, but you cannot sell. What's the health problem then? The, the same problem arises, that you consult the doctor. And before selling your kidney, of course, would consult the doctor. Yeah. So that's clear for me, but I would love to hear your uh, opinion on abortion. So if you have a, a new birth inside you, is that you, uh, uh, behavior and choice with your own body, or is this prohibition the protection of rights of yeah. ownership of the other new person and what if the parents decide to sell kidneys of their children mm -hmm. which okay. cannot take uh, responsibility yet. okay uh, yeah we'll have to follow up just follow up on the same uh, donorship um, issue i i don't know if you've heard the, in the netherlands there was a, a well, kind of a reality show, the Big Brother version, which was called Donor Brother, and the initiative was to show the situation in the hospital. It was one year ago. So the initiative was to show a situation in the hospital where uh, like five people were waiting for a kidney and there was only one donor who was uh, actually able to, to donate this kidney. So the, the supply and demand balance was uh, really not equal. And uh, there was uh, this idea for the for the watchers of, of the channel to vote which of the of the participants in the reality show were actually work to take this kid. So and there was a big uh, fuss in the society discussing how it should be. Is it moral to give the responsibility to the hands of the of the uh, watchers uh, of the audience of the program? And then uh, you can see the moral aspect of the issue that people are when when they when they see that 
I mean, how, uh, I mean, that there is no criteria uh, to decide which of those people who are in demand are getting this and this kidney, and they are the ones that decide, and they start to think. And this is a very nice example. That, uh, after all, it, it, uh, um, the organizers of this, of this TV show uh, told that it's thought, it's fake. It was just to cause a discussion in the society, but the, the discussion went in different aspects, and also in the trading of a donor of, of body parts. So it's, it was a nice uh, initiative, I think, and sometimes even in a conservative, more or less conservative society, to to to, to start discussing it. Uh, and maybe for for us it seems morally not acceptable, but you, when you go deeper into the problem and you see how many people die today, then you start thinking. Okay, very very good point. Uh, just you know, the thing that the problem is here. The question is only how do you, how do you solve it? It can be politics, majority of those who deserve to get it. It can be luck, depends where you are in in the line. It can be uh, some kind of arbitrary criteria, which is what is today. If you are older than something, you are not allowed to get it. So if you are old, sorry, we don't care about you because there are younger people waiting. So you cannot avoid the decision. Uh, and you know, the, the, the nice aspect of the economic approach is that it sort of avoids this kind of thing. It just makes everybody happy, in a sense. Now, uh, before I respond to that question, uh, I, uh, uh, this is a fascinating topic, not kidneys as such, but prohibitions of different sorts. I'm uh, happy you mentioned blood, because there is some trade in blood uh, possible in some places. Also, what markets, or where markets exist in this uh, field is, uh, for example, you know that there is problem with, uh, um, that there are some parents who can't have kids, and they can have kids only if, for example, an egg is donated to them. So, so trade, you have, you have trade with sperm and, and eggs, which is, by, by the way, a rather big business in, in Prague, in the Czech Republic, because in many parts of Germany this is illegal. So there are German uh, patients, couples, that want to have kids. They come over to Prague and they get egg from a Czech donor, typically you know, a student, uh, and, oh, but not, not necessarily so. But that, you know, it's a fascinating thing because it's it's legal. You can't call it market. You can't call price the, the money you get as a donor. They will, they are not really willing to you know, to tell you in advance. But if you go, if you go there, they tell you actually that you get you get uh, uh, you know, twenty thousand crowns for donating one egg, which would be what, uh, what I feel like thousand dollars, one thousand dollars per per egg. You know, too many girls. It's just you know rather than working the whole summer. You know, it's a nice way how to earn money. And there's nothing wrong about it because actually <coughs> she helps the couple who can't have kids have kids. Uh, and in some places this can't be done. For example, in America you you can even in Prague you can't advertise. In America you can advertise. So you can see in some college newspapers in America. I am willing to pay for an egg of a girl with these specifics, one hundred thousand dollars, and it's like scores in mathematic tests higher than this, IQ higher than that, blonde hair, blue eyes, and it. I mean, it's uh, it's perfectly legal, and you don't have problem with you know getting donated egg, and you know eggs are not that sensitive as kidneys because you know you have plenty of those, uh, but. I guess when you start with blood market and then this egg sperm market, you understand the, the message that prohibition doesn't help anybody. It just makes situation worse. And you know, kidneys is just used here because first it's a pair uh, organ, and at the same time there is a lot of people with failing kidneys. So you you have you have it you know, very sensitive because you have these people dying. So uh, you know, I encourage you to take that seriously and see 
that it's a real issue, a real economic problem. It's full of an eye of division. But I'm saying it can do not create any product. Because uh, if you like being nice, uh, organ, uh, trade of organs, uh -huh. then many people will be willing not to work, which is still the uh, like organs, and we do not create any output, we don't need any value to, we do not contribute to the market. They, so they, 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 they contribute to the market of kidneys. Well, and they, you know, a typical, you know, if you just see an example, you have one country is a rich country with those problems, you have another country, you know, Bangladesh, India, where people face different issues. You might be, a, you know, a mother of a family, ten kids uh, you have to feed. You don't have enough money. Your income is less than two dollars per day. And if you don't earn money, two of these two kids, two of these kids will die. What do you do? Well, you can actually solve your problem by selling kidney. You save a guy here, and you save two people somewhere else. Your know, people typically do not start with selling kidneys. It's uh, actually kidney may fit into the category of economic economists called human capital. And typically, they talk about education, special skills. Right. So people, when they face issues, they typically start with first using their monetary capital, let's say. So money. If they don't have money, they use their skills. Uh, so they sell their labor services. So human capital of that kind. But if you don't have money, if you are not educated, the only thing you have is you. So then you face a real life problem. Two of your kids are dying. There is somebody dying here. Why not to help each other?